You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. Joining me right now, a little closer to home, is DeKalb CEO Michael Thurman, an old friend of mine. He's the author of the book Freedom also, which if you haven't read it, you should read it. It is the history of African Americans in Georgia before the Civil War. Uh, So you are a complicated person, Mike Thurman, and welcome to the program. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you for being my friend, Martha. You know, I appreciate the relationship we've had over the years. Absolutely. Listen, obviously, the DeKalb County, DeKalb County is not directly over the police training center, but you guys are involved because it's a, it's because of the property and that sort of thing. So I, why, why I wanted you to come on was just to kind of give people some background about how we got to today and then what we should be looking for going forward. Well, thank you. Uh, roughly two years ago, uh, the city of Atlanta, then former Mayor Keisha B- Lance Bottoms, announced, along with the Atlanta Police Foundation, that they were uh, well, they were proposing to construct a public safety training center in unincorporated DeKalb County on land owned by the city of Atlanta, roughly 400 acres that formerly had been used as a um, as a prison camp, and that, of course, followed. Uh, several years of other advocacy around that part of our county, which is the South River Forest, the South River Basin. And we had had issues with our sanitary sewer system, with sanitary sewer overflow. Right now, Martha, we're spending $100 million a year to repair and upgrade our sewer system. Many environmentalists, as they should have, raised concerns. Uh, that was issue with a new movie studio and a land swap. So all of these issues came together. People in the community wanted economic growth and development, all had concerns. Now, more recently, uh, environmentalists who use violence and uh, intimidation and destruction uh, arrived on the scene, and it became a very volatile mix, and that's where we are today, at least that's where we were up until yesterday. And so what happened yesterday? On yesterday, uh, we I had a press conference with uh, Mayor Andre Dickens, who's a brilliant young leader uh, in our state. And DeKalb County, who controls the land development process, about 11 months ago, Atlanta had sought a permit to move forward with construction. Uh, during that time, we vetted their application conducted at least five or six different studies regarding a water runoff, uh, uh, wildlife habitats, so forth and so on, to make sure that this particular facility uh, would not have a a dangerous or or undermining uh, impact on the surrounding forest. The South River Forest is the most unique, uh, one of the most unique natural resources in Metro Atlanta some 3,500 acres, mostly in DeKalb County. We are committed to protecting this natural resource, but at the same time, we recognize the importance of having skilled, trained men and women uh, protecting and serving Atlanta. And by the way, 50,000 residents of Atlanta actually are also DeKalb County residents. So, you know, and it does seem to me, and this is what I have a hard time getting my head around, is that after, of course, the tragedy of George Floyd's death and the highlight of needing to have better police training. And of course, we saw it again play out uh, in Memphis uh, a few weeks ago uh, where, you know, and I, I, I separate the race issue from this. I know there's a racial component, but there's also a police training component. It, it doesn't matter if they're black, white or brown police officers. They need to be well trained. I don't understand the pushback because it seems to me that's a fairly small piece of this property that's going to be used, relatively speaking, and that it accomplishes the ability of being able to train police officers, multi-agency police officers. I think there's an opportunity for 
other, you know, to maybe even make some money on other police officer agencies coming and training there. And then you don't have to actually go to South Georgia, which is where a couple of training facilities there are now. It just seems to me it was a win, win, win on so many levels, but it was either poorly communicated or there were just some people that if they hear the word police, they just say it must be bad. Well, and there are advocates who believe that uh, the militarization of police is not good for society and so forth and so on. So this is where we are. This is what I deal with all day, every day, (laughs) is that different people have different priorities and imperatives. And we live in a world, and this is my uh, leadership speech for 2023, we live in a dominated and really imprisoned in a world of awe. Is pro-life or pro-choice? Is Republican or Democrat? Is black or white? Is liberal or conservative? What I'm asking more leaders to do is to insert the possibility of an and. Uh, I think through and uh, we can seek compromise and actually fuel progress. So our position, my position, in the middle of all this was that, yes, we need a public tra- uh, training center. Yes, we need better trained police and firemen. But it's important also to protect the environment. But those two things aren't mutually exclusive. It's 35,000 acres. So we can build, I believe Atlanta can build a police training center, and we can enhance and protect the environment. The agreement that Mayor Dickens and I signed uh, is that compromise. You know, I don't believe that compromise is a bad word. You know, po- politics is the art of, of, the, of, 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 the, of what you can accomplish. So I think we accomplished something. We are protecting the environment. We're also creating jobs. We add a component uh, where in the public schools of DeKalb and ATS, that should be a career track to help more young people in into public safety careers, whether it's fire or police or probation. So if you sit down, if we will stop talking and sometimes listen, I think we find common ground. Now, no one will be absolutely satisfied with this, to be quite honest with you, but that's politics. When is everyone all 100% satisfied? But everyone, number one, should feel like they were heard, and number two, can at least see something in this agreement that supports their view. Well, and I tell you what, you you piqued my interest when you said about a career path because uh, Barbara Ware, who's at the uh, Georgia Department of Education, of course, and you know I serve as the ninth district representative for the State Board of Education. We are dramatically expanding our career paths for students, um, and you know it's great if you're going to do them in DeKalb and and Atlanta and other places, but that ought to be something that gets put in place statewide. And Barbara Ware is the person to help do that. So I'm going to raise it to her, and if you want to call her, that would be great, too. Well, thank you for serving on the state school board. You know I'm an old school superintendent, right? Yes, I do. career education is so important. Because, look, even this is a reality, the problem with law enforcement right there is that we just don't have enough men and women seeking that career. So you can have better training, but still be understaffed. So the career education will help increase the number of men and women who seek a career, not a job, but a career in public safety. Well, you know, I met uh, Mayor Dickens for the first time at the Eggs and Issues breakfast earlier, uh, well, last month now. And it's funny because I've always liked him because uh, because being a chemical engineer from Georgia Tech, I'm thinking to myself, why did he go into politics? Because that's like <laughs> the top of the top, right? Being a chemical engineer, uh, at least in the engineering world, it's kind of the top of the top. But he is, it, it brings a different skill set. And I can't tell you how many people I've had say to me, I'm so glad he's not a lawyer. You know what I mean? It's it's nice well, to have... Wait a minute, s- now that's kind of an insult. No, I... Well, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) But you know what I'm saying? It's good to have different skill sets that come together and look at things. But you're right. Lawyers get a bad name, that's for sure. Um, So tell me what you think. I mean, has it settled down a little bit? Are are things a little more uh, safe there now where you're not having the daily problems you're having to deal with? Well, of course, it's an ongoing challenge, and but I think, what we really had to do was to separate that environmentalists were being painted with a broad brush as being the people who were advocating violence and, you know, engaging in 
gun fights with law enforcement. 99% of the environmentalists I know are law-abiding people who truly believe that we must protect the environment to save humanity on this planet. And many of them have criticized myself uh, for not being aggressive enough, but they've never been, they've never been violent or disrespectful. So one of the things I think we were able to accomplish was to acknowledge the legitimacy of their argument. Look, if you're driving an electric vehicle, you understand the importance of climate change. If you're recycling uh, your garbage, you're trying to protect our uh, society. You're trying to protect human life. So we have to just listen. One of the things that's a challenge in the 21st, 31st century in politics is that rather than listening, we're talking. So when I listened closely, I heard things that actually made sense, that were incorporated. We had to protect. Long before there was a desire to build a police uh, public safety training center in South Dakota, thousands of people had purchased homes there and it maintained those homes. And they had concerns, and they deserve to be heard and addressed. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you know, I grew up in South DeKalb County. I went to DeKalb County schools. I go Eagles. I, go that's Eagles. right. That's right. I love DeKalb County, and uh, you know. But I think that you know, I sent you a video a couple of weeks ago of this guy Constantine Kissin, who was talking about the global the climate change issue, saying that you know that that the big issues related to climate change are not going to be fixed by the people that live in developed countries it's going to be the people that live in less developed countries and what they want to be able to flush their toilets they want to be able to have automobiles they want to be able to have power 24 hours a day like we do and so i think what what his point was is that not only should you do all the conservation kind of things that you do but we've also got to innovate our way out of this uh because because people are going to continue to want to move forward, regardless of who you are. You know, George Bush famously said, even people who have never been free um, know what freedom is. They yearn mm. for it. People that have mm. never had progress in their lives still see the way the rest of the world lives and want that. And so we've got to find a way exactly right, leadership, to work together. Because leaders, Michael, do not necessarily make things happen. They make you feel like you can take the risk so you make things happen. I love it, Martha. That's, see, that's why you've been one of my top advisors all these years. Great advice. And look, and then seeing a bigger picture, no one would say Michael Thurman is this big environmentalist advocate. But you know I grew up in the country. That's right. I actually grew up in rural Clark County, Georgia, in Sandy Creek, which is now a, a nature center. We yes. just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the nature center. I get it. I love nature. I love to go back to Sandy Creek. I still can sit under the same oak tree that I played under when I was a kid. When the camp gets totally crazy, that's where I go to reset <laughs> and, and stabilize myself under my wisdom tree over there with uh, Randy Smith. So that is why I understand that having a uh, parks, and green land and nature trails reduces anxiety and improves the quality of life. But it's not an either-or proposition. You it's not either-or. And having well-trained public service officials allow us to be able to do that because it makes our lives safer and better. Right. And those who, I'm, you, listen, DeKalb County is the highest paid policeman of all large jurisdictions in the state of Georgia. My older brother was a lifelong 40-plus-year police officer. I get it. I've had unfortunate and heartbreaking uh, responsibility of having an officer killed in the line of duty. I've had to talk to his parents and his wife and look at his little child and know that dad is never coming home. I support men and women in uniform. I will do everything I can to support them, not just in word, but in deed. But I also know that we can do both. Mm. We, we're not in a position where... My success has to be your failure. Absolutely. Michael Thurman, CEO of DeKalb County, thank you so much for coming on today. Honored to be with you, Martha. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN.
It is the Martha Zoller Show. You can join us on the phones at 770-535-2911. Joining me right now is Laura Reese, who's the Director of Border Security and Immigration Center for the Heritage Foundation. And Laura, um, you know, I appreciate what Secretary Mayorkas is saying, but, you know, we have, in my view, a three-prong problem. We've got a border problem. Uh, we have got a legal immigration problem, which I think I'm personally a kind of a fan of the RAISE Act, but um, but I know there are other solutions to that issue. And then we've got, you know, an illegal immigration problem that has nothing to do with the border with a whole bunch of people about overstaying their visas. Uh, but personally, I have a couple of young women I'm working with right now that are from Africa that they have done everything the right way. They have gone to college here. They've gone to graduate school here. In one case, the person is a survivor of the genocide in Rwanda. Her sister is already living here and working here, but she can't get a visa to come back to the United States. So we have a broken system, not just at the border. The border is just where we see it every day. Well, you're correct, and thank you for having me I know that's a lot. That's a lot to throw (laughs) out at you. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, Yes, and and sadly, we have gotten away from bonafide asylum, bonafide protection for those who truly experienced persecution. And instead, the left has replaced it with a tool that they abuse and knowingly violate to hand out to anyone crossing the border Uh, like candy, knowing full well most of them are coming here for economic reasons, not because they've been persecuted. And they've rendered asylum or refugee protection meaningless. And and it hurts those who truly have fled persecution and uh, because they are just one application among the 8.7 million applications at USCIS. Um, and and so it, it's a shame, and, and Americans need to understand the, the asylum fraud that is being encouraged by Secretary Mayorkas and this administration, and not fall for uh, this claim of of everyone coming as an asylum seeker, um, and and get back to the intent of our asylum law. You know, and I I think it's important that's worth repeating is that this abuse of the asylum law where you have legitimate asylum seekers that are being deluded by the fact, you know, we're calling everybody an asylum seeker. And, um, you know, historically just fleeing economic problems. And look, I go, I'm old enough to remember uh, the uh, uh, John Kennedy uh, inaugural address and not remember it, but I was alive then and I've studied it extensively. I was born in 1959. That was in 61. And his his idea that we needed to, like, beef up our own hemisphere, you know, job creation in our own hemisphere could help us in this area. But that's way down the road beyond border security. Border security has to be the first thing. Even John Ossoff, who is a Democratic senator from Georgia, my my senator has said, if you don't have a secure border, you don't have a sovereign nation. That's from a Democrat. In Georgia. Yes, I think the uh, Democrats quietly, I mean, I I was told by a uh, a senior person at CNN of all places that the one thing he's hearing from the Democrats is uh, Biden has messed up the border. Uh, they will admit that quietly, but not publicly, unfortunately. Um, and, and yes, the first thing that absolutely needs to be done is to secure the border. We need to turn off the spigot. Um, and then deal with how do you prevent uh, future illegal immigration and trafficking of persons and sex trafficking and the drugs, et cetera, Um, and then uh, fix legal immigration so that it is uh, simpler and um, faster to either to have your case decided. If you are eligible for a benefit, grant the benefit, if you're not eligible for the benefit, deny it and, and in fact, have the person leave the country. Um, and, and so then if it is no longer faster and easier to come here illegally, then more people will choose the legal path. 
So how do we get there? Well, like I said, we got to we securing the border. One, Congress has got to turn the money off to the Biden op- current operations, um, where all they're trying to do is press process more people in faster um, under the darkness of night or the disguise of so-called lawful programs when they're not in fact lawful, um, turning that money off so they can't keep doing this. And then returning to policies that have been tested and that we know work. And that is that goes to the prevention goal, which is you prevent people from coming in the first place. If you apply consequences, if you tell them you cannot enter, if you try to enter, you will be turned back. You cannot stay and build up years and years of residence here to then use that as a shield to deportation. You cannot work here. These rules will be enforced. There are consequences then people will stop coming, and those who are here unlawfully, if they cannot find work, uh, if they can't be, send remittances home, if they can't bring family members here, then they will self-deport. Uh, you don't have to deport every single person that's here illegally. But if you start deporting more, uh, people will get the clue, and the risk factor changes for them, and they will change behavior. Yeah, because because really, the, the, we're spending so much time on the illegal side of this that we, we're not recognizing that we got big problems on the legal side. You know, we've got big problems. We overcomplicate fiancé visas, okay? I worked for Senator Purdue for five years, and when we got our briefing from ICE at the beginning of his term, that's all they wanted to talk about was fiancé visas. And I remember I asked the question, is this really the biggest problem we got in immigration? <laughs> and and she goes, and sh- the woman says, you'll have to talk to our legislative liaison about that. Well, I don't think it's the biggest problem that we've got. We've also got a whole bunch of people here that are on H-1B visas that are more are kind of like indentured servants because they have applied for their green card. They can't change jobs. Their green card is being is taking forever to get there. Their wife can't work or their spouse can't work and and they're waiting and they're staying in a job where they could probably change jobs and do better because they're if they change jobs and they got to start the process over again. I mean, it's a mess any way you look at it. Yeah, and it's a shame. We're always having to play defense on the illegal immigration policy field, and we never really get to address uh, fixing the legal immigration field. Um, but we, we need to get to more of a merit system. Right now, we hand out about a million green cards a year. Uh, about two-thirds of that is family-based, uh, which there, leads to chain migration. Uh, it's very expensive. And Uh, About a third of it is employment-based, and we need to switch those ratios. We should be focusing on the nuclear family to end chain migration and to expand then the um, portion of the pie that is going to employment-based based on what this country needs, skills that we need, market needs, uh, and merits. Um, And then many of those issues would, would go away. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So do you have any hope that we are going to make any progress on this issue? I mean, is there any movement in the Biden administration? I know there is some movement among some Democratic senators, and Senator Ossoff did make that statement publicly. He didn't make it privately. Um, So is there any move? Do you think there'll be any movement on this issue? Unfortunately, no. Um, because the the latest announcement by the administration is yet another uh, parole program where they're telegraphing to future illegal aliens, uh, use this CBP mobile app and go through a port of entry and we'll parole you in. Uh, and oh, by the way, you should apply for asylum. And, and if you don't use this path, then sorry, you're not going to get in. So... And, and they're already touting, well, look, the numbers of people illegally crossing between the ports has already dropped in January. All they're doing is shifting the numbers to a port of entry. Uh, but these people are still ineligible. And so Secretary Mayorkas is lying more about it. Um, and, and truly, it's a shell game. And unfortunately, members of Congress and Americans are going to believe him and say, oh, look, the numbers are down. The crisis is getting better. Problem solved. When, in fact, it isn't. 
Um, and Congress is so split that, you know, we haven't been able to pass an immigration legislation uh, or bill in, since 1996, a major bill. Um, and, you know, just a few members can, can shut down um, any reasonable bill. Um, so, unfortunately, I think it's going to take a something drastic like a terrorist attack uh, for people to wake up and suddenly call for some border security. Absolutely. Uh, we, are, we are very much back to a pre-9-11 posture. So um, if people want to know more, how could they find out more information? Uh, they can go to heritage.org uh, and immigration. We've got a number of um, commentary pieces on uh, this very pro- new parole program I, I've been talking about there, and uh, as well as a lot of other issues. Um, they can see what states can do to prevent illegal immigration within their own states. Uh, and an interesting report on um, NGO and phone tracking that we did, uh, showing that a number of NGOs along the southern border have helped illegal aliens. Um, and just after 30 days following these phone devices, they went to every congressional district in the mainland USA. Well, I appreciate you being on with us. Go to heritage.org. Take a look at all the resources they have. Uh, and and uh, Laura Reese, it is great to talk to you. Well, thanks for having me on. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show. Rod Huey's here with me. Like Good morning. On Thursdays. Good morning, Pastor Rod. And joining me on the phone right now is Mayor Andre Dickens. And uh, I am so happy to welcome him to the program, even if, though he did go to Georgia Tech. Andre Dickens, <laughs> welcome to the program. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martha, for that introduction, and uh, welcome, and yeah, go Jackets. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, it's funny, anytime I tell somebody or talk about you and say, oh yeah, you were a chemical engineer from Georgia Tech, people are going, why did he get into politics? So, <laughs> why don't you tell us that first, because many of our listeners may not know you. <laughs> well, yeah, I loved going to Georgia Tech. I, I'm a nerd. I loved uh, science and math in high school. And I became first in my family to go to college. And I went to Georgia Tech right up the road. And, you know, I wanted to be an engineer, but I also knew that at 16, I one day wanted to be mayor. Uh, chemical engineers get paid. Mayors get, you know, a whole bunch of work. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided to do the chemical engineering first so I can make a living. And then, uh, but I always was civically engaged in my neighborhood association, my NPU, my church, and then, um, you know, various nonprofits. So I just kept being civically engaged, even though I was working. And uh, eventually I decided to run for office. Well, my middle son went to Georgia Tech and is a mechanical engineer, so we are a house divided, so (laughs) it works out well. Listen, um, I wanted to ask you about the police training center, and first, just a little thumbnail history of it so people know how we got to where we are today, and then where are we today? Yeah, so, you know, Atlanta owns property in DeKalb County and unincorporated, you know, South DeKalb. It is uh, a big area of 380 acres, and 85 of these acres we're going to use for a public safety training center. And this training center will be for police, firefighters, and the community to bring about, you know, public safety throughout the region. And uh, the 85 acres, much of it is where police have been training uh, for decades. It just fell into disrepair in the 80s and 90s, and so we stopped training uh, out there. But the firing range and a few other uh, tactical uh, uh, places are out there. Right now, it's basically old buildings, old asphalt, and rubble from uh, former uses, and it's long been cleared uh, for, uh, you know, from any kind of forestry. So the 85 acres is going to be used to be a state-of-the-art first-rate uh, training center with an emergency vehicle obstacle course that the firefighters will learn how to drive those big trucks and um, ladder trucks, where police will learn how to uh, drive and, and do the maneuvers they need to do. It will also have space for the community to meet, also to do their neighborhood watch training and citizens uh, police academy. All of these things, you know, we got a horse the horse um, barn and stables are going to be out there, as well as the canine kennel. So 
you know, I give people the relevant the, the relative size of 85 acres. My high school in Atlanta, Mays High School, is over 70 acres. Um, so um, the other part of the land, the other 300 acres, uh, Martha, is going to be preserved as green space with some trails in it and places for the public to enjoy. Right now, that, that is not the case. So we're going to, you know, preserve that and make it useful to the public. So there'll be a huge part right next to the Public Safety Training Center for us to make sure that police do community-based policing strategies and tactics uh, to keep us safe and, um, you know, to really engage the community. And the, the adjacent neighbors are fine with it. And so what's the status today? Because I know we've had a little bit of a little bit of news coming out of there over the last couple of weeks. So what is the status today? Yeah, uh, on Tuesday, uh, the DeKalb County CEO, Michael Thurman, and his team issued us a permit. Uh, the land disturbance permit means that we can go out there now and start uh, doing our construction work. Uh, that was key. Uh, the DeKalb County uh, looked at this project, looked at it for environmental, looked at it for, you know, construction stability, looked at it for community benefit, and they added their inputs into it and made it better. The community had lots of input uh, that they liked some things and enhanced some other things. So now we have this uh, project that is approved by uh, the community stakeholder group. It's approved by DeKalb County and, of course, approved by Atlanta Police and Fire. And now we are ready to start construction whenever we can kind of, you know, get the contractors and get our planning in order. So, you know, and, and it, we'll start moving forward. And construction will take, you know, a year and a half or so, and then uh, we'll be done. And are we beyond the kind of violence that we saw over the last couple of weeks? Have we gotten that under control? I sure hope so, Martha. You know, Atlanta is a place of, you know, peace where we know how to do peaceful protests. We're the headquarters and the cradle of the civil rights movement. You know, every week here in Atlanta, you don't hear about it a lot, but we have about two to three protests. And they're usually small in nature and, of course, peaceful. And people protest any number of things, because, you know, CNN's headquarters here, you know, we got the Civil uh, Center for Civil and Human Rights. So people like to make sure, and, and the King Center, people like to make sure their voices are heard. And we are fine with peaceful protests. But when these individuals decided to throw Molotov cocktails, throw explosives and fireworks that could hurt people, and then they blew up, a, you know, caught on fire a police patrol car, I mean, that patrol car could have, really ignited even more and, and hurt people that were peacefully protesting. So we had to get those folks out of there. We got them out of there within one block, wow. so seven minutes. And I think that sent a message to these, um, you know, these extremists that the city of Atlanta, the, 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 the uh, local and state partners are not here to play games uh, with violent rioters. We are okay if you protest peacefully, but if you turn violent, you riot, you need to go back to the home that you came from, which is not most of them were not from Georgia. So many of them are not from Georgia that, you know, Georgians need to stand up and tell these people that's not how we do things. Mayor Dickens, how are you doing? Uh, Pastor Rod Hewitt. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice uh, to meet you, too, Pastor. Let me say, first of all, I'm a big fan. I think that you have done an outstanding job so far. And so you've got a fan out here. I'm sure you got many, but I wanted you to know that uh, real quick. One of the things that, that makes me a fan is your love for community. Everything you do, you involve community, and I think that is so important, especially when you have different things going on where, uh, let's say, you know, what happened in Memphis and different things. It's really important that there's that, you know, that there's that connection there between the community and policing and all those things. What are you doing to continue that? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Pastor Rod, and I really appreciate those words. Um, you know, I grew up in the community, and I learned from community members. They made me who I am today, and I can't ever think, uh, you know, make make any moves without thinking about what does uh, the neighbors think, what do what do the community think, what what impacts are my actions going to have on just regular, everyday, hardworking people, family members, um, and so. I continue to have outreach to the community. Uh, just last night, my deputy chief operating officer was at the neighborhood association meeting for the community right next to the public safety training center. So we send key officials, 
throughout my organization out into the community to touch base, to find those key points that community members care about. Sometimes folks just say, I want I want to be heard. You know, I need somebody to just know that I exist and know that, mm-hmm. you know, this side of town matters. And I know that because I grew up in a side of town that was, you know, you know, not always the one that was, you know, positively um, showcased on the news. So I go to those communities and I say, I hear you. I see you. How can I be helpful? We're going to continue to do that. We have town halls. Uh, and people show up in, in numbers to these town halls. And folks are surprised, Pastor Rob and Martha, that I actually answer every single question. That, you know, I try to get out of there uh, without anybody saying he didn't, you know, take my question or treat me seriously. So that might mean I'm staying there a long time. It might mean that I'm listening to people that, you know, talk in circles, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm going to be there. <laughs> well, you know, I consider myself an Atlanta girl. I actually grew up in South DeKalb County, went to Columbia High School. And, um, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I've worked very hard over the years in doing mentorship and things like that. Um, and my husband and I moved up to Gainesville 30 years ago, but, um, but I, I'm an Atlanta girl at heart. And so I wanted to have this time with you and a couple of things. And we're going to do this more often because I heard in your heart about saying you were the first to go to college. But I got to tell you, Mayor Dickens, there's something we are not doing for young men. Uh, I have three sons. I'm I'm very aware of this. We have gotten the message to girls about going to school and going to graduate school and doing all that, but the men are dropping out, and there's a lot of work to be done there. I also serve on the school board, uh, the state school board, so I look mm. forward to interacting with you about that. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time. I know you had a hard out to get out today, but anything you want to leave folks with related to the police training center? Well, yeah. Well, Mark, the one thing I want to leave before I leave that, you just talked up a subject that I care deeply about, which is youth. Uh, 2023 is the year of the youth in Atlanta. So we are telling everybody that this year is the year that no matter what your organization is, your business, your church, synagogue, or what have you, mosque, everybody needs to do something for youth. That means you can employ them as an intern. You can engage them as a mentor. You can, um, you know, educate them, teach them something, whether you're a teacher or not. You you have things that you know. Um, and we are saying that if everybody puts in on this group project of the year of the youth, everybody does their one thing for one, one youth. You know, anybody between the ages of zero and 24, we're considering a youth. I want everybody that's listening to do something, and you can go to atlyearoftheyouth.com, and that's on the City of Atlanta's webpage, and you'll find out how you can get involved. And so that is one of the ways to help bring down youth crime, to help youth go off to college. we got we got scholarships here in Atlanta uh, for young people that, that want to come from the city and go on to schools, uh, to colleges. So anyway, there's a lot that we're doing to make sure that we empower these youth to um, do positive things and really uh, one day make Atlanta the best city to raise a child. Um, and so that's the thing I wanted to say most, but then the uh, Public Safety Training Center, you know, I appreciate all the – the, the, the people that are sober and uh, honest about the need for positive police training. There's a lot of miscommunication out there. You know, people were hurting after what happened to George Floyd, and they wanted police to be held accountable and have more training and to do body cameras and these other things. And that's what this training facility will provide, more of a way for the community and the police to interact and for police to still be trained to uh, to deal with violent crime. Violent crime is still real across America and definitely in metro Atlanta. So when you train these officers to deal with violent crime, but also deal with the community uh, and able to de-escalate the, the, the issues that are out there and uh, resolve conflicts, that's a win-win, and that's what we get out of this public safety training center. Mayor Andre Dickens, thank you so much for your time today. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you both. Take care. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.